Thank you. You can be seated. Thank you so much for the love. I always feel so appreciated when I come to VFC. And this is a home away from home. This is family. It's always such an incredible honor to be here with you all, to be with pastors Jeff and Beth, uh, all of the kids, the Jones kids. We knew them from the time they were either little bitty or still in the womb. And they are like family. I feel like I'm an uncle and I just watch them. Uh, I just sit and see their facial expressions, the energy they bring, and I just love them. Oh my gosh, I just love them. And I love your staff, the whole staff. And in fact, just you, I, I love you. It's so good to see you again, it's so awesome. I'm so excited about being here with you all. Pastors Jeff and Beth, as she said, and Tina and I have been friends for over 30 years, and they are some of the dearest friends that you could ever hope for. Um, I, this past December 29th, I had a heart attack when I was out for a walk, had a plaque rupture, and uh, thankfully, by the mercy of God, uh, I... First of all, was laying in bed that morning and I knew I needed to get up and I knew I needed to go for a walk and I felt a prompting to get up and go. Being led by the Spirit of God is so profoundly important. Had I not gotten up, I wouldn't be standing here today. I got up to go for the walk and I got to a major intersection in the, in the area and uh, I just collapsed. A lady happened to be hustling to uh, her appointment and had a series of things to do. And when she saw me fall, she pulled into the parking lot and immediately began to call 911. And they were one mile away. It took them about a minute to get there to two minutes. And they started CPR on me, but it threw me into a coma. They didn't think I would live. I was in ICU in a coma for five days, no activity in my brain except my hypothalamus that kept my, my heart beating. And uh, Jeff and Beth have been so important in my recovery. Uh, just the calls, the check-ins, the love, just... The amount of love that I felt, I'm just blown away, and words don't do justice to the affection that I feel to your pastors. They're the, they're the kind of people, they're the kind of people that do that. They're the kind of people that do what they preach, and uh, I'm just, every time I see them, last night we went to dinner, and I mean, I'm doing a lot better in my emotions, my emotions, uh, were affected, the hippocampus, the amygdala was uh, impacted by being offline, and I'm doing a lot better, but last night I couldn't, I couldn't hold it. Uh, I cried just telling them how much I love them, and I'm just so, so, so grateful for them to invite me to be here today and a part of this Mind Games service. And today I do, I want to talk real talk about your mental health. In this mind game, strategies for managing anxiety, panic, depression, and anger. And today I want to talk to you about you. About you. I want to talk to you about, first, the question of how are you doing? How are you doing? How's your mental health coming along? And as a friendly reminder, the message today is for educational purposes only. It's not meant to be a substitute for your therapy. And there's things you're going to hear that you're going to be like, man, that hit home. And I want you to take those and engage them in your life. And then there will be some things that maybe aren't so relevant to you today. And on those, feel free to just discard. No offense. I'm happy that you're here today and that we get to do this. So really... Seriously, how are you doing? How are you? You may have averages that cause highs and lows, but how are your averages? How are you when you think about your state of feeling? 
your affect. How are you doing when it comes to not just sitting here in this moment without the threats and stresses that have come against you day after day, hour after hour, minute by minute, but right now you're in a safe zone listening to the Word of God, and question is, is how are you doing? And I'm curious, do you have these kind of inner ponderings that take place of, why am I so moody, man, why? Do I hyper-react? Why is it that the smallest things sometimes seem to trigger me? It can be trigger me to areas of anger and rage where I become hyper-aggressive. This incongruent with the actual event that took place right in front of me, or maybe you're one who begins to look at the internal happenings, the ruminations, the thoughts with regard to anxiety of your survival, of your belonging. Maybe every relationship seems to throw alarms off for you of stress, and you're wondering why in the world do I keep having such stress around people that I should not be having stress around? Maybe you're thinking about the times you've had panic and panic attacks. You could feel it in your chest. You could feel it in your skin. You could feel it in different parts of your body. Maybe you have these thoughts that you just can't seem to grab hold of, and at times you feel shut down. You ask yourself this question, why is everybody else so normal? Why my peers, my friends, why my family? Why are the people that I go to church with, they got no problems. And I keep struggling with my inner world. I'm having mind games. I'm having all of these different circuses that are taking place and they keep jumping around and and I think I have something disciplined in and then the next thing I know volcanically it explodes to places that causes me to be in personality somebody that I don't want to be you think to yourself why am I so messed up why am I the one that's in this battle why is it that I keep ruminating And maybe you could scale your emotional states. Maybe you're in a mild emotional state. Maybe you're in a more of a moderate, or maybe you're in today a severe state of affect regulation. You you don't know what to do with it. Well, I just want you to know that I am so excited that you're here today because you are not alone. You're not alone. The World Health Organization reports in 2019 that one in every eight people, or 970 million of people around the world are living with a mental disorder, with anxiety and depressive disorders being the most common. The World Health Organization also reports in 2020, because of the COVID, y'all have heard of this thing called COVID? Because of COVID-19 and Uh, maybe fentanyl being on dollar bills and about a thousand other things. The number of people living with anxiety and depressive disorders rose significantly from the 19 uh, report, and the estimates are that the increases have been 26 to 28% increases respectively for anxiety and major depressive disorders in just that, that one year. My psychologist colleagues, they are absolutely convinced that that number, percentage-wise, is way low. What I'm saying to you is that you're not alone. And there's something about being in community. There's something about knowing that you're not isolated in the experiences that you're having. Even when it comes to things like panic, The Cleveland Clinic reports that every year up to 11% of Americans experience a panic attack. Approximately 2 to 3% of them go on to develop a panic disorder, a repetition, a constancy of repeated unexpected panic attacks. And what's crazy is that statistically even women, women have twice as much, they're twice as likely to develop 
a panic disorder? Or how about the anger and rage component? The Mental Health America nonprofit reports in 2020 of people who took an anxiety screen, 71% felt easily annoyed or irritable at least half of the time or nearly every day. 82% reported being so irritable that they shouted at people. If I rode with you in your car, followed you into Sam's or Walmart or wherever you go, I wonder, would there be these moments that embarrass you later, that shame you, that cause you to feel like, gosh, what in the heck is going on with me? Maybe you're one who start, starts fights. Or if you begin to sense this adrenaline rush, adrenaline's a neurochemical that along with cortisol, puts you in fight, flight, freeze mode. And maybe you're in a moment, and I mean, the next thing you know, you're not just like wanting to face somebody. It's like, we're going to finish this. We're not just going to put on a front of a fight. You're going down. And you realize later, I'm not even, I don't even know that person. I don't even care. There's something deeper going on on the inside. Maybe you're in arguments. Well, I'm convinced that today, in the season we're living in, the generation that's been even most recent for us, that anxiety, panic, depression, and rage rates are actually much higher than it's ever been before in the history of the planet. And the reason is, is because our conditions today are actually supporting us to have inordinate kind of emotional spinning and happenings and discontentment, frustration, and sometimes just complete shutdown. When you think of how we as humans tend in a modern generation to reduce every happening, reduce it to a physical experience, that it's nothing more than neurons and synapses, neurochemicals, we forget that actually we are living with a dual nature, a dual substance. Maybe, maybe what it is is the rapid pace for which we live. Previous generations didn't deal with that or the bombardment of information. Just all of the news, and I don't know about you, but do you watch the news and just feel stressful? You just feel like, man... I feel like I'm under attack. I feel like things that I dreamed of and wanted and desired in the news, it's like, man, everything is an attack. Maybe in today's generation, you're feeling the effects of isolation and individualism, which is so common, and you're at church today. And I just tell you, you've chosen well to be here. And the reason that you've chosen well is there's something happens when you are hanging with other people. Did you know that just a hug, a handshake, just looking into the eyes of another human being and having affection in those eyes, just stepping into that releases in your brain oxytocin or what's called the love hormone, and you begin to feel things that cause you to get regulated and feel more content. All of that happens as a result of being with people, but we live in a generation where more and more we're isolated. Maybe it's something you've noticed of the lack of skills around relationships. And if you don't have or know what the real skills are in relationship, relationships are just going to make you angry. Or feel like, I'm not good at. You ever heard somebody who's gone through a divorce and they'll say, I'm just not good at marriage. I'm never going to get married again. And there's stress in that. So now what it is, is I am adapting my life on the basis of just simple, superficial ideas. Maybe you struggle to manage emotion. In our generation, there are health threats all over the place, right? Right? whether it's COVID or, again, the fentanyl-laced dollar bill at the gas station. Everywhere you go, there's something, from monkey pox to some other kind of pox to having no money in your pox. 
And these conditions, they truly are, they're just so extreme that they build stress upon stress upon stress. And even if it's not you, I bet you know somebody. Somebody who's dealing with mental health problems and your heart just goes out to them. And I can tell you, for me, my heart goes very much out to you and to others who struggle because of struggles that I had. I went years, even after Bible college, I went years struggling with panic attacks, not knowing that that was what was happening to me. I would find myself, after a great experience at a church, hopping in my car and driving to my next meeting, and I would be experiencing rumination and condemnation and self-contempt. And I wished I had a said, man, that's embarrassing that I didn't uh, deliver that part right. And I didn't get that scripture completely right and the way I quoted it. And I would have these ruminating experiences, and it would be multiplied whenever I would bring other individuals into the scenario. When I think of what it was like, I think about a time that I was down in Panama City area of Florida at the beach for a week's vacation, and we were going to meet some friends that we had been friends with for a long time. We were going to meet them in Birmingham on the way home. And I called them to see if everything was still on go. They had desired to see us. They hadn't seen the kids in a long time. And I remember as I'm talking to the man on the phone, my friend, he tells me that he was now planning that they've had a change in their plan, and he wanted to know, how long are you going to be in Panama City? And I said, we're leaving immediately tomorrow morning. And he said, oh. And of course, I'm not a genius, but I picked up, you're disappointed. And I said, why, what's up? He said, well, we, were, we had a change and we were actually heading down to the beach ourselves. And we thought we'd just hang out with you there. And I'm like, well, we've got to head on home. And so I'm trying to now then say, no, we're not, we're not coming to see you. He wouldn't let me not come see him. And I remember that night at his house, just feeling such layers of shame, shame upon shame, just feelings of, I am an idiot. Why did I not just force not staying here? I've ruined their opportunity. They need to go to the beach. They want to go to the beach, and they can't go to the beach because of me, and I didn't do anything wrong, and the injustice of it, and you begin to just ruminate. And I laid in bed that night, and I'm rehearsing it over and over, and the rumination causes my brain to feel like it turns to jelly. I could not wait to get up and get on down the road. Those panic attacks were not something that just originated with me. And in fact, there are a lot of other issues in my personality that would show up, that would show up, but it wasn't something that started with me. You see, my granddad on my mom's side, my granddad, he ended up being a very successful man in the savings and loan world and he was known, he made an influential impact, he was an amazing man and one of my heroes. But my granddad, he had an anxiety disorder. I mean, it was crazy, the anxiety he dealt with, but he would use mechanisms to manage his anxiety. When he's only four years old, his mom and dad didn't have enough money so that he could live at their house, so he was shipped off to live under the roof of his aunt and uncle. All from that time on, money was a huge deal. He, we would buy him. And I mean, he was a man of some means later in his life. But we would buy him golf clubs because he liked golf. He lived on a golf course, a golf fairway. And we would buy him these expensive golf clubs. He lived in uh, kind of a vacation area of northwest Arkansas at the time of his retirement. And it's rocky, it's the Ozarks. 
And he's like, I'm not playing with those clubs in this golf course. So he would keep his golf clubs under his bed because he was so sure he would never, ever get another golf club that's new in his life. And it's crazy because he was a person of means. He could buy the golf store. What are you doing? But he was coded. And his anxiety as he raised my mom and her sisters was was intense. It was overbearing. It was difficult. He loved his daughters. But he could not keep from projecting onto them his overt anxiety, and he didn't have the social skills to help him be self-differentiated and boundaried, and so he would do power plays. Like my mom one time in high school, she had this beautiful convertible red car. I mean, it was like a showpiece, and she was proud of it. And my granddad told her, said, you ever smoke a cigarette? I'll sell that thing. He got into the car and saw that there was a cigarette butt in the ashtray. When she got home, she said, Dad, Daddy, where's, where's my car? And he said, I sold it. She said, what? Do you understand that there is a way to handle boundaries and discipline? Granddad didn't necessarily know how to do that. And those kind of wounds stuck with my mom. My mom actually developed a psychological disorder, a mental disorder that she struggled with her whole life. You know, for me, I can't remember one time my mom and my dad, later they got divorced, but he reflects back, he can't remember an occasion where she ever apologized. There was never a willingness to repair. And the repair that she would want would always be you do it. You bear the burden of it. Well, you can imagine as a little kid, before I'm even one years of age, I've developed my attachment style. And what happens for me from that all the way to the environmental interactions with so much of my family of origin, I am already predisposed and prepared. There's a threat. And this is something that we call epigenetics, to where generationally you have genes that pass from one generation to the other. Epigenetics doesn't mean that you'll necessarily present the actual conditions that are in your four parents, but what it does mean is that you can turn those genes on or turn those genes off by certain things you think and certain behaviors you have. Well, here I am, I'm growing up, and I am ruminating. You know, when I was a little kid, I'm probably seven years old, I've got a list in my underwear drawer of the people who are no longer my friends. And my mom found it one time, and she said, what is this list? And I said, oh, nothing. Completely avoided. I didn't want her to know. That's embarrassing. And my brother's two years older than I am. And because there weren't a lot of boundaries, especially socially, uh, and we were chaotic and dysfunctional in some of those pieces, my brother, who's two years older than me, he would have exploited that, and he would have told all the kids in the neighborhood. He would have embarrassed. And so here I am as a little seven-year-old kid, and I don't even know why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I'm preparing against a betrayal. And when I'm in high school, I come to faith in Christ in a very real way. I had faith in Christ from the time I was much younger. But I personally began to have a very real faith in Christ. And when I did, at age 16, I began to pursue some some help and some ideas. And what ends up happening for me is that as I'm pursuing, you know, what, what's going on in me? Why am I the way I am? Why do I think the way I think? Why do I feel the way I feel? I'm seeing some spiritual relief and help, and I'm learning to guard my thoughts, but in, in moments of chaos, in moments of betrayal, and my mom and dad, my dad was my spiritual leader and hero, and he had multiple affairs, and then gets divorced to mom. Mom makes me her enmeshed codependent husband. I'm a surrogate. 
I'm the one that is supposed to meet her emotional needs, which I had no idea the damage that would do to me. And as a Jesus follower, I've got all of this stuff. I'm just trying to figure out. I'm trying to manage. And it's not getting any better. It's getting, it's getting at times worse. And then I would, you know, spend time with God, and I would find relief, and things would get better, and then things would get worse. So for the, just the next few minutes, I want to help you. I want to help you understand what I've come to know around mental health and human flourishing. And what I want you to see is that there is a triad for mental health and human flourishing. And in the middle on the screen, you see the graphic where your spirit soul is in the middle. Now, understand that you're going to always live in difficulty, challenges, and frustrations if you assume that you are reduced to a physical being and neurons and neurochemicals and some kind of natural explanation for everything you remember, everything you think, every emotion you feel. No, the fact is you are a, an immaterial soul. You are a spiritual being. And that soul, that spiritual being, it feels, it thinks, it plans, it organizes, it has memories. You say, well, how do you know all that? For sure, how do you all know all that? Well, there's several reasons. I would encourage you to get Dr. J.P. Moreland. He's a philosopher. He's considered one of the top 30 philosophers of the world, but he's also a theologian and a Christian, and he's a friend. He's got a book called The Soul. Strongly encourage you to get that. But when you consider the soul, we have near-death experiences. Y'all ever heard of these where somebody almost dies, or they do die, and then they come back into the body. And somebody's like, well, how does that prove there's a soul? Well, what do you do with the reality of some of these stories that are undeniable, where a person dies in a hospital, they leave their body, they see, they know, they hear, they are listening to conversations doctors are having, they're hearing conversations family members are having, and when they end up coming back into their body, they're able to recite in exact quotes what people were saying. How do you account for that? That's not an activity of the brain. You realize your brain's neurons and synapse, they can't go into other parts of a building and then begin to listen in on everything going on. But biblically, the soul is clearly the place of thought and memory and feeling, it's cognition, rationale. So when it comes to mental health, mental means mind. Mind's immaterial is a part of the soul. You can't address that by just thinking you are reduced to a physical person with a brain. It all begins with you are a spirit and soul, and there's a dependency of the spirit and soul on the brain and body while you are an embodied soul. Once you leave your body, the soul no longer is dependent upon a body. But you have the spirit and soul, but then you have the brain and body. And this, of course, is your neurons, your synapses. This is the different functions of memory and your ability to organize and think that's on a physical body analysis where you can look at it. You can see that there are things going on in the spinal cord, that there are these research points that help you know what, for instance, the, the vagus nerve does and, and how it communicates with the different parts of the body and how whenever you are in emotional dysregulation, that it affects the different organs of your body and illness, sickness, disease becomes much more prevalent in your life. All of that would go back to your brain and body. But here's also something. We are interpersonal beings. Our spirit, soul, we are social. We are designed by God to be in relationship. And what is interesting is, is that for us to be in emotional, mental health, and human flourishing, we're going to have to recognize things that are around this third piece of the triad of how to manage. 
how to walk in healthy relational protocols. And by doing so, we can prevent so much anxiety, panic, depression, rage. And yet, unfortunately, we learn very little about these things. And so, when I look at this, I think of the scripture in Hebrews chapter 4. Look at this in your Bible. Hebrews chapter 4, the word of God is living and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit, soul and spirit, and then joints and marrow. And as a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Let's look at it with a Greek insight. Notice the word of God is living. It's full of life. It is the life of God. And it is powerful. It's where we get the word energy. The the word of God pulsates with energy that created the universe. This energy can set things right that are upside down. This energy is profound in its capacity to change who we are. And it penetrates like a two-edged sword to the division. The word division here is a Greek word that literally means a distribution is of gifts. Hebrews 2 and verse 14 actually speaks of it that way. There is a division or a distribution of gifts. The word of God gifts you. It gifts you first in your soul and spirit. It gifts you in your brain and body. And it gifts you in your relationships. Notice that it gifts you. And he says that it penetrates into your soul and spirit. The real you. This is the you. You are a soul and spiritual being. And notice that you are going to have the word of God create life and energy, the life of God there. And then it's the joints. And the word joints in Mara, the joints is a word that has to do with physical joints. You see, in ancient Greek times, these were medical terms. Harmos and mylos. I have no idea if I said those right. But these were medical terms that were used in the day of this writing, and Morrow represented the spinal cord in the brain, really ultimately what we would know today as the nervous system. I find that profound, that there's something about the Word of God that actually impacts you on a brain nervous system level. That it starts with your soul and spirit, but then jumps into your joints and marrow. And then he says, And is a discerner, is a judge of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. This is so interesting for me when I look at Scripture and the emphasis the writers had on how you manage your soul. In 3 John, we realize that Paul, or excuse me, John would say, I wish above all things you would prosper and be in health, mental health, mind health, transcendent, immaterial beginnings of health that you do that as your soul prospers. That there was an emphasis on the soul. Today, we are physicalists in our generation, and everything's reduced to physical happenings. Now, the brain is a retrieval device that God has given us to take that which is in the soul and to translate it into experience. So when our brain has the firing of neurons and synapses, it's just grabbing from what is in our soul. When you have thoughts and cognitions and choices, all of that is in the immaterial side of your dual nature. Your brain is just picking up on it. So if you deal with brain psychology without dealing with soulish psychology, spiritual psychology, you're going to not actually deal with the root. And so in Scripture, there's some interesting verses. In Scripture, we read about things like to abstain. 1 Peter 2.11, abstain from fleshly lust which war against your soul. Now think about this. Sin. Today, things like sexual sin. Who cares is the idea many have. It's only a physical thing. I want you to know that it actually wars against your soul. That when you're not married, 
and you are active with anything that has to do with sexual sins or any sin that you could possibly engage is going to impact your psychology. Do you know you're going to struggle emotionally if you do sinful things? And you're not even going to know why. Because down in your soul, you have been impacted by the choices you've made. Now, there's no shame. There's no need to drill down with contempt about what you have done or what I have done. But in solutions and in understanding why we are the way we are, it's so important. I think about how Lot, in 2 Peter 2, 8, and verse 14, those verses tell us that righteous Lot, that he grieved, he vexed, vexed, his righteous soul by the things he saw and the things he heard. Do you know that your soul gets impacted by the news you watch? Your soul gets impacted by how you entertain the movies? And I'm not saying that you shouldn't watch anything. I'm just saying that we are guardians and stewards of our soul. If you want to get mentally healthy, if you want to be healthy even in your body, it begins with the prosperity of your soul. And there's something about the Word of God that the engrafted Word, James says, is able to save your souls. There's something profound about our makeup. When I think of, again, the the way that we are made of, there are some protocols that you might wonder, how, how do I go about these protocols of how to move forward to be mentally healthy, impacting your soul, spirit, impacting your brain, body, and impacting you and your relationships? We'll start in the middle, in the green. If you want to do one thing, to get yourself right, spiritually, soulishly, get born again. Be born again. If today you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this isn't just a religious, I have A, B, and C I could do, and I just chose Jesus. But wait, wait. No, this is impacting you at the core of your humanity. Understand to be born again, to be baptized of the Holy Spirit. When you read your Bible, when you meditate, when you do gratitude practices, when you do affirmations, do you realize all of these are actually known in neuroscience to have an impact? But it doesn't begin in your brain and body. It begins in your soul. Wendy Suzuki, doctor at New York University, a profound scholar and researcher of memory. She is a neuroscientist, and she has great Research around affirmations. When you declare, this is what God says about me, I'm saying what God says, it'll change your life. When you listen to music and worship music, when you engage a faith lifestyle, Lord, I believe what your word says. I'm not going to be moved by the circumstances. I don't care what the devil says. I don't care what my community says. I don't care what my family says. I'm believing your word. Do you know that when you do that, you step into an empowerment circuit? in your neurobiology, and neuroscientists study your neurobiologies and an empowerment circuit causes you to have a release of the neurochemicals that causes you to feel like the suffering is not now destroying me, the stress is not now destroying me. Now then, I am becoming better. If I had time, I could go more into that. But nonetheless, it is an empowerment circuit. And then be sanctified, live sanctified, avoid sin. Why? Because sin will corrupt you down at your core soul level. This is so profound. And then you deal with your brain and body. If I could just encourage you to do one thing for your brain. Now, since my heart attack, my brain has not been fully uh, functioning. Now, you may feel like that it's doing okay today. However, you need to know that there are things that only I would know, and I, I'm, some months have been very difficult. And so I learned what I got to do to get my brain back online. My docs tell me it could take to two years. I'm like, well, I, I love the science around all that, but 
I'm believing God doesn't, doesn't take me two years. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tap into my soul and in my spirit. And the Holy Spirit's going to help me, and he's going to bring things to my remembrance. Come on, somebody. And so if I could tell you to do something, get your sleep right. Do you know that Dr. Andrew Huberman, if you aren't familiar with Dr. Andrew Huberman, you can look him up, neuroscientist at Stanford University. He says the single most important thing you can do for your mental health and health overall is get your sleep right. Now, how do you get your sleep right? There's several things you can do, but one of them is, is get some light therapy first thing in the morning. First thing, get some light therapy. Whenever I get up, first thing I do is go outside. You've got to be outside to really get it. I go outside, whether it's cloudy day, sunny day, I'll spend 10 minutes or so in the sunlight. Why am I doing it? It, it resets my circadian clock. And it prepares my brain to get right. Not only do I do that, but my diet. Do you know that what you eat, what you eat, which is the third one, what you eat is profoundly important to your mental health. Do you know sugar, fructose, actually will degrade your emotional experiencing? And you're like, I don't care, I want a donut. Well, do you want a donut or do you want to cuss the guy driving in front of you? <laughs> and I like donuts too. Those uh, are profoundly important exercise. Exercise is central to everything. If you could just walk briskly for 40 minutes a day, you'd be amazed at the impact that have on you. It's not on here, but it's called optical flow. Do you know that if you get outside versus going to the gym, this is going to be a surprise to some of you, if you go to the gym and get on a treadmill, you don't get the effect of if you go out into nature, in your neighborhood, wherever. And when you are walking and you have trees going beside you, the bilateral movement of things around you does the foundational work of what ends up being in psychological therapy, EMDR. It's the framework that you get access into parts of your emotional brain that now then you can reprogram. Optical flow. When I walk outside or run, I like to watch a leaf that's at my eye level. I like to watch it all the way. I like to watch it go right by my head. Profound impact upon the brain. Cognitive behavioral issues, which is a whole therapeutic process that you need to know about the empowerment protocols. And then you need to be in a, a therapeutic relationship. And then... Finally, on the interpersonal side, if I could tell you to do one thing, engage your story. Your brain has been formed by your family of origin, both the harm that they did to you and the love and nurture that they gave you. And if you don't know your story, your brain will take everything in your life and presuppose it's a threat because it's similar to what happened to me when I was a kid. Dr. Todd Bowman and I, I believe you have a slide for this. Dr. Todd Bowman, a psychologist, he's a colleague with Red Ink Revival. And he and I are doing an online conference. You can see it's the last slide. But in this conference, we're going to begin working in your story. We found it. We're going to begin working in your story. You're going to learn things like how your personality evolved. You're going to learn conflict and how it disrupted you. You're going to find out about your emotional deep needs. You're going to find out how your soul and brain function together, how your family of origin shaped your psychology. You're going to look at the primary domains and protocols for human flourishing, and you're going to learn how redemption, the big R, redemption, Jesus, redemption, actually brings about a change in your story. I would encourage you to go to redinkrevival.com slash story work and join us for this online conference. And then at the end of that conference, you'll have an opportunity to sign up to a second opportunity, which is to get into your own story work and dig down into it with Dr. Bobin and I uh, together, me together. We're going to go places with you that well, I believe will will change your life forever. Well, today, I don't know where you're at. My heart is with you. 
And my desire is that you today would employ some basic foundational framework so that you don't suffer and are tormented anymore. My desire is that you would have peace and joy. You would have great grace. What if all of us together, I mean, wouldn't this church... If you think of all of the uniquenesses of who we are and all of our stories, the pain, the sorrow, the emotional spinning, what if we all got together and we began to, as a family, learn why we do what we do? What if we became healthy humans? What would that do to this church, to our revival, to the way that we go about changing our community? And what would it do to our families? What would it do to our kids? I wish that all of our kids could have learned these things as they were growing up throughout life. This is amazing. And today, as I wrap this up, I just want to say that today, if you have never opened your heart to Jesus Christ, this is where your human flourishing begins. Earlier, Pastor Jeff led us in a call to faith. Well, I want to revisit that with you. And where are you at? Listen, you may be here and you may be like, oh yeah, I signed the papers back when I was 10 years old. But my heart is not sensitive to the kindness of God. I have no emotion that has any allegiance to God's commands or God's ideas. I just want you to know today's your day to say my life is not going to continue on the path it's been on. I'm awakening into this beauty and wonder that is Jesus Christ. Can I pray for you? Let's all bow our heads and shut our eyes. Maybe you're sitting there and you're like, I, I, I just, I would love today to take the courageous step to say, Jesus, I want to know you, meaning I want to know you as a person. I want to know you as the one who gives me direction, who is my Lord, that I am your servant. I want, maybe you've never been born again. Today you can be born again. Maybe you have been born again, but you've walked away from the Lord. Today's the day for a revival in your heart and soul. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I just want you to have an empowerment move that yesterday I'm grabbing hold of eternal life. I'm grabbing hold of what God is grabbing hold of me on. Is there anybody in here? Just lift your hand now if you would. I'm going to pray for you. I'm not going to call you down to the front. We're not going to embarrass you. What I am going to do is I'm going to allow you to know that you made a decision, a faith that's not just a mind imagination, a step into something extraordinary. Anybody? I'd urge you, don't let waste this moment. Don't allow this moment to get past you. I'm not sure if there's any hands or not. I, looking around, but I'm going to pray for you. Heavenly Father, so beautiful that you love us like you love us. Thank you for making us so sober and aware that we are spirit beings. We are a soul, a living soul that is immaterial and eternal. And that this new birth that's through the power of your word is what brings transformation. We thank you. You're good. Jesus, we surrender our lives. And if we've walked away from you in days gone by, we come back now. And Jesus, we receive your forgiveness, your gift of righteousness. Lord, help us to restore our mental health, to live life that is more abundant. We thank you. We pray it in Jesus' name. God bless you guys.